Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'm on today with Dr. Guy Man. Uh, I saw a few of his videos, and so we'll be talking about that. But first, uh, for anyone who doesn't know him or uh, doesn't know about his videos, he's going to tell you about them, and I'm going to link his channel in the description so you can go see his videos for yourself. So, uh, Dr. Guy Man, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so I'm, I'm Dr. Guy Man. I'm not actually a doctor. That's just the first thing that popped into my head when I was thinking of a channel name. Uh, I, I've i been in the creationist movement for about three years. Uh, my channel is mostly just a response channel, you know, to speak my mind about the stuff that's happening. Uh, uh, that's that's about it. Okay. Um and so what what got you uh involved in creationism? Uh, oh, that's a good question. It's been a long time since I've joined. Okay. Probably since well, the main thing is creationism is banned in public schools. Uh, um well, you say it's banned in public schools? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. They they can't teach it. Uh. Oh. Uh. Well. Um. Uh. Well, creationism isn't. Well, when you say banned, do you know? Oh, okay. Well, uh, Savannah wants to answer this one. He said, why is creationism banned in public schools? Come closer. It's hard to hear you when that far away. Hey, I was president. I have a nose strip on. I was president of FCA for four years, or president for one year, vice president for two, and a leader in my school's FCA for four years, being high school, three more being middle school um, as a leader. And... Creationism is not at all banned in public schools. The only restriction that is placed upon public schools is that any prayer within the school, any religious organization, has to be student-led. And so whenever we prayed, we would offer for our teachers to pray, and they could accept that. But they couldn't themselves stand in the middle of the school and ask for people to pray with them. It had to be offered by a student. A student had to ask to be prayed over, basically. Um, we as students could proselytize as much as we wanted, and we did as well as Muslim students in our school were offered an organization similar to FCA um, and the same restrictions were put upon their organization. A teacher couldn't stand up and proselytize, but the students are free to speak as they want, if that answers. What do you think about, about that? Okay, that's, that's interesting. Um, the only place that I would say creationism is supposed to not enter would be science and the reason for that is the scientific consensus is that uh is that creationism or scientific consensus is that evolution is the is our uh, best uh, understanding uh of of uh biodiversity right now and uh and so that's the reason it doesn't it doesn't come in there, but you can actually learn about it in like philosophy class. So if you take comparative philosophy, you can learn about it in history. Uh, it's got a great deal uh, to do in history and uh, things like that. Okay, so it's banned because of the scientific consensus. It, isn't that like the bandwagon logical fallacy? Uh, it's true because the majority said so? No, it's not simply banned because, you know, a bunch of people say it shouldn't be uh, in there. It's banned because of the preponderance of evidence. Well, let me I let me rephrase that. It's not necessarily banned. You can talk about it. Like my teacher could say, "This is evolution." Uh, there didn't mention creationism, but yeah, Savannah's teacher did uh, in when she was in middle school, but. You're not allowed to teach creationism as scientific fact in in public schools because of the preponderance of evidence for evolution. 
But you, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, creationism is still taught in a number of schools. I live in Louisiana, and we actually have a law, uh, or the uh, 2008 Louisiana Science Education Act, that allows intelligent design and creationism to be taught alongside evolution in, in the science classroom. And that was something uh, Zach Coplin and a number of other uh, activists a, a few years ago got involved with and tried to uh, have that overturned, but it's still in effect to this day. Okay, I think that's actually a good law because, you know, teach the controversy. Have you ever heard that? Yes. Or sorry, 2009, not 2008. Thank you, uh, ULL Ragin Cajun. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, uh, well, the thing about teaching controversies is that there has to be a controversy for, for people to teach one. We don't teach the controversy between chemistry and alchemy for instance, or neuroscience versus phrenology, or astronomy versus astrology, for instance. We don't teach any of those controversies. The only place modern people really try to focus on a controversy uh, in this area is intelligent design or creationism. Uh, ver uh. At least over 98% of scientists in the relevant technical fields don't accept creationism or ID uh, because of the preponderance of evidence supporting evolution. And we can get into that uh, a little bit later okay. if, you, if you'd want. Okay, so so would it, would it cross the church-state separation or whatever is keeping creationism out to have like a, a, a class specifically for controversies. Mm, I don't think so. Um, not as far as I'm aware. I mean, you could have like a, uh, like a you know, debate class or something. I guess, or people talk about things like that. I guess. And yeah, you know, I mean, that's just that's just what I think. I don't know. I'm not a uh, like a a teacher. I'm not entirely familiar with uh, laws and regulations surrounding what classes you can have. I don't know, perhaps at the university level you might be able to have something like that. Um, uh, I do have to ask, uh, because RJ uh, Downer brings up the question, oh, why do you think there is a controversy? Well, because people argue uh, whether or not creationism is true, and that's, that's, kind of, that's technically what a controversy is, right? Right, but do you think... Is it just people, or do you think it's scientists in the relevant field who are arguing about it? Uh, oh yes, there there are uh, scientists in the relevant fields, like like because yes, there are there are people like Nathaniel Jensen or, or um, Jonathan Wells who are in like uh, genetics and uh, I think biochemistry, but they make up a minuscule fraction of of the scientists and even of that they haven't published any technical work that attempts to refute evolution. Okay. Well, 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 why, why do they need to publish technical work to be credible? Why isn't credibility determined by your evidence? It is. So when you publish a technical article or when you, when you write a technical article, you have it peer reviewed, right? So you have people who are who work in the relevant fields look over your data, your materials and methods, your abstract or conclusions, etc., to determine if what you've said is true. And they, and if and if you wrote a or and, and you've heard of you know reproducibility, they should be able to reproduce your results. Uh, you know, uh, like if someone says you mix these two chemicals together and it gets this third chemical, well, someone in a lab should also be able to mix these two chemicals to produce this third one. And then if it goes through very rigorous peer review, and it turns out that everything, or at least most things in the paper, the, the large conclusions and whatnot check out, then the, the parts that are correct are, they go on and they're critiqued more and they are refined and that's how science continues. That's how science grows. Okay, so, hmm, 
Oh, so that's what peer review is. Yeah. So, um, and that's actually one of the things you bring up in, in your first video was uh, you played a clip of me talking about, or, or a clip of the Answers in Genesis crew talking about one of their their magazines, I think it was, and then I responded if the if the magazine was was looked at by non creationists, and uh, and uh, I think you said something to the effect of uh, that it shouldn't have to, or, or you can correct me if I'm wrong. Hmm. Um, yeah. I don't want to misrepresent you. Okay, if I if I say something that's wrong, I want you to say, "No, Jackson, you're wrong." <laughs> Well, well, it, okay. Uh, well, see, just because something is not peer-reviewed, it doesn't make it um, not credible or not true. I mean, one plus one equals two. That's that's not peer-reviewed. That doesn't. It is. Mean, it is. We can all confirm that. We can all peer-review that that find. Okay. Uh, I mean, if I were to say something like, you know, there are pixies that live in my socks every night, and I know this, and someone were to say, well, do you have any evidence of it? I'd say, no, I just know that they do. You wouldn't take me, you know, very credible. You wouldn't consider me to have credibility in that regard, would you? No. Right. So when, so if someone would make a claim like, nature selects uh, only a certain a certain number of members of the population and then they get to reproduce and pass on their genes well we should all in theory be able to to uh, test that which which has been tested over and over and over which is the principle of natural selection okay so um, I, I also uh, I have another question from uh, RJ Downard. Uh, how do how do you when you're reading articles by creationists, uh, do you fact check uh, what they say? Hmm. Well, I usually don't use creationist articles okay. to because I want to avoid bias, so I don't use those. Um. If you want, I made uh, I made a video uh, where I where I fact check some of the claims made in a creationist uh, article because creationists have their own set of uh, technical or kind of technical journals, um, and I reviewed a paper that was done by uh, uh, Georgia Purdom and a few others, and it was talking about how to determine kinds or how to determine different types of kinds. And one of the things they were arguing about in the paper was a conclusion made by a different creationist that this species of Australopithecus, you, you know what Australopithecines are? Oh, yeah, like Lucy. Right, yeah. So there was a species of Australopithecus. Lucy is A. afarensis. Uh, this species is A. sediba. So this guy named Todd Wood, who's a creationist, he was also in the movie... Uh, uh, is Genesis history. Um, he came to the conclusion based on looking at the features of Acediba that it was in the human kind. And so Purdom and the others were detailing papers that disagreed with his paper. So I went not only, so I looked at not only his paper where he made that conclusion. I also looked at the, uh, all four of the papers in the article by Georgia I heard him at all that were critiquing his art, his article, and so I fact checked each one, and I showed in each case that they were either missing data or misrepresenting data. Uh, so, so that's what peer review is. In a sense, um, I'm just uh, I'm just one person doing it, so I could be wrong about uh, everything I looked at, and so well, usually I even have my own scripts peer reviewed. I might ask RJ uh, or Apologia or Rational Mind or uh, PZ Myers or a number of other people to check my scripts for me to make sure things are correct. And sometimes 
things still are wrong and people will correct me in the comment sections of my videos. And so that's really what I hope for because if I'm wrong, I want to be corrected. I want I want to be as close to the truth as I can be. And that when I when I screw things up, I want people to say, "Hey, you screwed up. You got to fix that." And so that's really what I try to get out of uh that's part of what I want to try to get out of uh YouTube. Um uh, but you you said that you said you don't read creationism uh, literature. Uh, no, I don't. Okay, so where do you get the idea that there's a controversy? Well, well, because the definition of a controversy is disagreement, typically when prolonged, public, and hated. That's from the dictionary, and mm -hmm. and people are definitely have been def arguing about creationism for like decades so mm -hmm. that technically makes it a controversy okay so are you saying it's a it's a it's more of a public controversy or a, or a scientific controversy <clears throat> well i i think it's both you know there's you know there's that the evolutionary science and creationist science so when you say creationist science are you saying that there are uh, well for instance do you think that there are uh, peer reviewed uh, articles by creationists that are ending up in things like nature or PNAS or any of the other big name scientific journals uh, well, well no they the, the big scientific journals won't let creationists publish their stuff because they don't think it's, like, credible or something. So where did you determine that? Hmm. Hmm. Well, well, there's, well, they're not there. You only publish stuff that's credible, right? They try to, yeah. <laughs> but do you think... Do you think the reason that the creationist articles aren't in there it, it depends more on the, the the factual data within them, or that there's some sort of conspiracy uh, in the in the magazine that is keeping them out? Hmm. That's a good question. There, they're probably. I mean, there might be a conspiracy, but I don't know. There's not. Um, I've actually worked in the Department of Mammalogy here at LSU, and I know a number of... I have quite a number of friends who are scientists. Uh, there is no controversy. Or, there is no conspiracy, sorry. Um, the reason there's not a conspiracy is that if if creationism could make for instance, accurate predictions about the past and the future, if it had data that it could put forth that we could test and show fits in with only this narrative, then that would be substantial. That would show demonstrably that at least some of the claims of creationism are correct. But what we, the only thing we do see when we test uh, evolution versus creationism is that only evolution allows us to make predictions about the past and future, which I mentioned in the video, and you also made a comment about. Um, for instance, I mentioned Tiktaalik. Uh, you, you've heard of Tiktaalik? I've never heard of Tiktaalik. Okay, so Tiktaalik was a fish uh, that has... It has fish characteristics as well as tetrapod characteristics, plus it has characteristics intermediate between both. And so the existence of this guy, of this fossil, uh, was predicted about five years before it was discovered by uh, Neil Shubin and a few of his colleagues. And so they went up to Arctic Canada, where they found strata that was Devonian in age. Devonian was a, a period way back in the Paleozoic. And they predicted that if evolution is true, and if what we understand about the transition from fish to to amphibians is true, or fish to tetrapods, then we should find something 
with characteristics intermediate between both fish and tetrapods. And we'd already found a number of them, like Pandarichthys, Eustonopteron, uh, Gulugungia, and a, a number of others. Um, but this is one they predicted. This is a fossil they predicted and then they found. Because if, if, evolu if evolutionary theory weren't true, and creationism were true, it wouldn't make any sense for us to find something like this it wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to go to a certain strata in a certain place and find a certain stage of, of evolution there. That wouldn't make any sense. Or a certain stage of this, the, you know, the progression of this lineage. We wouldn't be able to do that. They would be, everything would be in the same layers. We'd find a uh, modern fish with Tiktaalik or, you know, modern birds with dinosaurs and humans with dinosaurs and things like that but we don't find these things so what what do you think about about that hmm. i i i i think i i'd agree with the the uh, answers in genesis that that the flood uh, buries these you see the the more fossils that are more dense will sink lower so, do you know what um, so that idea um, oh and I forget the name uh, hydrologic sorting you've heard of that's you've heard of that right hydrologic sorting uh, yes okay so hydrologic sorting says that like the right the densest of these should be on the bottom right well Polygia actually did a video where he looked at that idea and he uh, applied it first to uh, trilobites if I remember correctly or maybe it was clams. I think it was clams. So you take clams. The very first clams in the fossil record are these little guys. These very little guys. And then they get progressively larger, although some, of course, stay small, as you ascend the record. Also, if, if such a thing like that were to happen, and the densest of these guys were to go to the bottom, then we would find only, or, you know, we would find these gigantic dinosaurs much lower in the strata, for instance, than the little mammals. Well, didn't we, didn't we find these little things encased in rock? Little what? The, the, the clams and stuff that you're talking about. Uh, I mean, yes, they're fossil. All fossils are are at, at least partially in rock. That's how they become fossilized. A lot of them become permineralized, where the minerals in the bones are leached out, and they're replaced with the surrounding rock. Yeah, rocks. Rocks are really, really dense. They sink. They sink far. So, you know. Yes, I mean rocks do sink, but how? But there is no mechanism that answers in Genesis or ICR or Discovery or whomever. They have never ever proposed a mechanism by which we could get the layering of rocks that we see today, and how we could get these animals and plants and whatnot in between the layers. They have never proposed a mechanism for that, and uh. With regard to, with regard to the idea that these uh, these strata are laid down during the flood, which is generally what Answers Genesis proposes, part of the assumption of that is that there should be no erosion between the layers, because they're laid down quickly. So there should be at the very least very minimal erosion, if any, between the layers, right? Because erosion would would uh, indicate that they were. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I think I might have misunderstood you. Um, uh, well, first I have to ask, uh, you understand that these things get deposited, that like the clams, when they were alive, they got deposited, right? Like dirt was covered them or whatever, sediment of some sort covered them, and then they fossilized, right? What, they, they have to be in dirt? For them to fossilize? Or some sort of sediment, yes. They have to be... Like, they're not in the rock 
and then they fossilize. They're under this. They're under the sediment, and the sediment is compacted, and that eventually becomes a rock, or it becomes lithified. I think is the word for it. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So, um, what I was saying about the erosion was that if there were erosion between the layers, that would indicate that these aren't recent, right? That they weren't laid down quickly, one on top of the other, wouldn't you say? Well, of course it wasn't recent. The The flood happened a few thousand years ago. No, I mean, I mean, right, right. But according to Answers in Genesis, these sediments, which they call the flood, sedi flood and post-flood sediments, the flood sediments are laid down very quickly during the flood, right? Uh, I, probably. I haven't read much about that. Okay, well, um, so... What they what they assume, what Answers in Genesis assumes when they say things like these sediments were piled very quickly by the flood, is they're assuming first that these things somehow separated into distinct layers during the same event. Now there was a guy named Potholer fifty four who did an experiment where he took sediment, different types of sediment, like one type of soil and I think gravel and some other types of soil from around his house put them in a bucket with water, and then shook it up. What happened was the sediments layered, uh, I think, by particle size. Like the largest particles were, you know, uh, on one, uh, they're the largest particles, and the smallest particles were, uh, were kind of distinct, right? The smallest sort of uh, fallen down with the, Larger ones wouldn't have. So, if that were, if that were the case, then we should expect all all flood layers to be distributed in the same manner. But we don't, because the particle size of each layer varies a lot. The there, you you can't get the distribution of layers that we see in today's world from a flood event. Hmm. Right. Um, we also do see erosion between the layers. Uh, there's a place, RJ, I forget the name. You'll have to remind me. Uh, the place in, in England where, uh, where there is erosion. Well, basically these, these geologists back in the 1800s, if I remember correctly, realized that there was erosion between these layers. Like this one layer was laid down, which was Silurian. There was erosion on that layer. And then there's kind of a layer. There's like some conglomerate, which is a type of rock. And then there's a Devonian layer. And so we see there's this erosion between the layers, meaning that they couldn't have been formed at once. Uh, they must have, one must have been laid down. Sicker Point, there we go. Thank you, RJ. It's called Sicker Point. I'll put it here on the side uh, for you. There you go. Um, and so, so they realize these layers must be very old. That's part of how geologists realize that the Earth was very old because the idea that the Earth is only about 6,000 years old was developed back in the, the 1600s. And that was kind of the way people thought for a long time. And so in the 1700s, 1800s, people started uh, making discoveries uh, like Cuvier, this guy named uh, Georges Cuvier discovered you know, the idea of extinction. Uh, Lyell and others realized that the Earth goes through very gradual, uh, what they call uniformitarian uh, processes, where there's this very slow uh, layering or erosion or what have you. And so, uh, and so they were creationists, at least at first, and they realized the Earth couldn't be as young as uh, Usher had had indicated that it was. And then in the eighteen hundred mid eighteen hundreds, uh, you know, Darwin published his idea of natural selection, and things kind of went from there. And so, so even before Darwin. These geologists, these English geologists, realized that the Earth couldn't be that young. Not based on what we know 
about geology and and now what we know about biology as well as astronomy and a host of other fields it's just these processes can't work in the time that in six to ten thousand years they just can't work so what what do you think about about that i'm sorry if i'm i'm sorry if i'm throwing a lot of topics out there if if you want me to like stay on one topic then you know you can cut me off and say hey let's talk about this more i don't want to overwhelm Okay, uh, about the erosion. How how do you see erosion if it's underground, under the layers? So the ro so there's this thing called an angular conformity where the rocks are sticking, like, they're at an angle. And so there's also been erosion on the layers, so they're kind of uh, cut away so you can see them, you can differentiate between the layers. They're not, like, underground. They're sticking out. So you can also see that part, and you can see... We know how these certain layers, how these layers form, uh, even more so today than we did back then. And so we can see like the conglomerate that's in between the Silurian and Devonian layers. We know that doesn't just form, you know, rapidly. That would have to form by erosion. And so you know, you can uh, take like a, a geology class or whatever, and they talk about erosion. One of the things they talk about in, a, in like an intro geology class. So it's all very interesting stuff. It's very neat. Hmm. Er erosion, that that can happen quick, you know? Mm, depends on what type of, of erosion you're talking about. If you're talking about rocks, then it's not very quick. Um, but so so um, you don't, did you say you, you do or you don't read Answers in Genesis stuff? I don't read Answers in Genesis stuff. What about like a uh, Institute for Creation Research, Discovery Institute? Yeah. Any of those guys? Hmm. No, I don't read those. Okay. Okay. Um, so where do you get so primarily where do you get your information on creationism? Uh, cre creationism? Uh, hmm. that's that's mostly from the videos that I see uh, people respond to. Okay, like who? Like, like you know, when someone like Vice Reiner or Gullis Cranium responds to a creationist, mm -hmm. that's usually how I know what creationists are saying and what the uh, what the rebuttals are. Okay. Um, so, so you're saying you, you get your information about creationists from the atheist response videos? Mm. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so then why do you, if you see that there are these rebuttals put out by the atheists, or even if they're not atheists, if they're just Christians critiquing creationism, then why do you believe the creationist position? Hmm. Well, well, because the the rebuttals the rebuttals are wrong. Okay, so how do you determine that the rebuttals are wrong? It it, it takes fact checking. Okay, so when so if when I made so when I made my argument about evolution making predictions. Did you go to a website to fact check me on that, for instance? Hmm. All right. The uh, evolution making predictions. Let me type that in. in predictions. Uh. Ah, oh, the first thing that popped up: new scientist, evolution myths. Evolution is not predictive. So what is the what is the name of the website? Newscientist.com. Okay, so New Scientist is generally uh, pro evolution is generally a pro evolution um, website, but I can actually demonstrate that evolution is predictive. As I, I pointed out several examples in my video, um, for instance, one of the, like, like I told you earlier was uh, 
Tiktaalik. If you want to read more about that, you can read the book Your Inner Fish, uh, which is by Neil Shubin. I'll put it here in the side chat. Uh, by Neil Shubin. Okay, so there's that book where he talks about his discovery and a few other other things related to evolution. Well, a lot of other things related to evolution. Um, but that is an example of where he made a prediction based on what he knew about evolution, based on what the technical literature at the time said about evolution. And he made this prediction. He had an idea of what we should expect in a certain strata, in this in a certain area of the world, what sort of form we should expect if evolution is true. And so they went and they found what matched their prediction. But that's not the only example. For instance, Microraptor is another example. Microraptor was originally predicted by this guy named uh, William Beebe, or Charles Beebe. I think it's like C. William Beebe. Um, he predicted back in like 1912 or 1915, something like that, that if birds are descended from dinosaurs, we should find somewhere, and also partly based on some uh, observations he'd made regarding embryonic birds, that we should find an example of this intermediate dino bird that has asymmetrical flight wing, flight feathers on its front and back limbs. He called it Tetrapteryx, which means four wing. So almost 100 years later, 2003, uh, we find Microraptor, which has asymmetrical flight feathers on its front and back wing, or front and back limbs. So uh, Okay, well, well, there's a modern bird that looks like that too. It's called the cassowary. It's it's the okay. So the cassowary is a species of paleognath. Um, paleognaths are these group of of birds that are like the uh, the bird tree kind of makes the fork, and it's like the paleognaths on one side, and the neognaths on the other. So paleognaths are like the ostrich, uh, emu, rias, uh, cassowary. So the cassowary. Um, may look a little bit like that outwardly, uh, but it has a lot of features that Microraptor does not have. Uh, for instance, the cassowary does not have a long bony tail. Microraptor does. Cassowary does not have teeth. Microraptor does. Uh, Microraptor also shares a lot more commonalities with other uh, dromaeosaurid dinosaurs. Uh, dromaeosaurs are the group that birds are very... Are, like sister to, um, uh, like uh, Deinonychus and and uh, Velociraptor and these other guys, um, it does not share a lot of commonalities with cassowaries. Cassowaries share far more characteristics with modern birds than they do, with, or than skeletally than they do with with Microraptor. Yeah. Hmm. Well, does does that make sense? Well, that, that kind of makes sense. Okay. Uh, oh, that, that book you mentioned earlier, uh, Our Inner Fish, is that what it was called? Oh, also, um, oh yeah, yes, yes, Your Inner Fish. I put it here in the side chat. Also, um, the article you were looking at, uh, this guy, Japeth555, says the article that you were talking about, the myth that they're talking about is that evolution isn't predictable. Uh, they're not saying they're not saying evolution being is can't be predictable. They're saying the idea that evolution isn't predictable is a myth. Okay, so about this, um, your inner fish thing. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it, the people say that people are apes, but this is our inner fish. That's that's kind of a contradiction. Are we fish or are we apes? Well, both. And there's... Okay, so... Um, so, cladistics... You, you know what cladistics are, right? Uh, yeah, like... Like, taxonomy? Right, right. Okay, so taxonomy, or cladistics, it's... Details. Um, so, in cladistics, we are, we are apes. We have all the characteristics of apes. You can't describe... You can't describe the other apes, all their commonalities, without describing humans. Similarly, you can't describe all the commonalities of of all mammals without excuse me without describing humans. Same with all amniotes, uh, 
vertebrates, chordates, etc. So fish, as we use it generally, is a colloquial. We think of fish, we think of these guys who you know swim, uh, they're scaly. We think of fish in terms of today, today's fish. So in the distant past, like 450 million years ago or so, um, uh, the our, our distant ancestors were fish. We are descended from a group of fish called Sarcopterygians, and I can put that in the side here also. So Sarcopterygia, okay. So Sarcopterygia are they're also called lobe finned fish because they have these that these little kind of arms, uh, these little stalks, and they've got the little fins on the end. Today, the only living Sarcopterygians, aside from all tetrapods, are all uh, basically all animals that are like either four limbed or descended from four limbed animal or four limbed uh, vertebrates. Uh, the only ones, the only fish, the only Sarcopterygian living fish that we can I would call fish are the lungfish and the coelacanth. And so we actually share more genetic uh, commonalities with coelacanths and lungfish than coelacanths and lungfish share with with the other fish like goldfish and carp and bichers and all these other guys. So so we use uh, the characteristics at the or the definitions or what was it to describe them? Um, it's. Kind of. When we think of when we think of uh, fish, we don't think of generally. We don't think of fish plus of modern fish. You know these sea living guys plus tetrapods. But if you were to look at it from a cladistic point of view, all fish are chordates, um, meaning they all have uh, dorsal hollow nerve cord. They all have a, a, a notochord, a post anal tail and pharyngeal slits at some point in their development. Uh, so we have all those characteristics. So do all fish. And so when we look in the fossil record, plus when we compare this with genetics, we can see that we are related. We can see that we're related genetically to fish. But we can also see that we share a long history, that we have a long history of descendants, and some of these descendants were fish. Well, what we would today consider fish, like Tiktaalik is one example. Although he's not our direct ancestor, he's a a close relative of our own lineage, at least as far as we understand it. Um, and there are, of course, others. I mentioned Pandarichthys, Eusthenopteron, uh, Sauripterus is another. Uh, and so, so, yes, in a technical sense, we in one sense we are fish, uh, but we are also primates. Okay, so sorry, ancestors, our ancestors, not our descendants. My bad. So we determine this by comparing our skeletons. In in part, that's the that is the um, that is the fossil record part of it. We compare our skeletons. Um, although in some cases we are able. Well, that's paleogenomics. I won't get into that. But um, yes, for our for the fossil record, we compare our skeletons. But for living animals, we compare our genetics, our genes. Oh, someone's yeah, downstairs is yelling at me. Hold on. Okay. What? Oh. All right. I know fish isn't a clade. Japheth 555. Well, it depends on your... Uh, what would we call it? We'd say you know, chordates is a clade. Vertebrata is a clade. Fish is a colloquial term we use to describe a set of of uh, animals. So, and yes, I do apologize for saying descendants instead of ancestors. Sorry about that. Thank you, uh, Japheth five five five, for correcting me. Hello, Shannon and RJ and Idol and Japheth five 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 and Lady Girl Person and Clade Starfish and everybody else. How are you guys doing? Uh, so anyway, uh, we. Compare our skeletons. Um, so all all humans have the same skeleton, right? Does that mean all humans are related? Yes. I mean, we are all ultimately related. Yes. So, um, the most parsimonious conclusion is that, well, 
we can compare our anatomical structures with our genes and then compare genes among different members of the human species and then we can see who's more closely related to who and we also understand that genes code or that yeah genes code for anatomical structures so there's a direct link between anatomy and your genetics or anatomy and physiology and your genetics and so the most parsimonious conclusion when we're looking at the fossil record is to assume that also their genetics corresponds to their anatomy their their skeletal anatomy because of course we can't see their their uh, physiology so if if we're all related does that mean all sex is incest <laughs> yeah ultimately yes <laughs> we're all one big family uh every, i think all humans are like is it 55th cousins or closer or something like that someone please correct me on that if i'm wrong uh yeah so yes uh, yeah we're all about uh, uh a number of cousins or closer so hmm all sex is incest ultimately yeah <laughs> that's hmm, that's I'm a bit skeptical about that well uh well we can demonstrate that we're related to all other humans uh we can do that genetically we well, can also i mean we can do it not just with nuclear genes but also with mitochondrial dna well considering that a dna and and genes is is made up of like the the de de deoxyribonucleic acids that de that determine the proteins and and how our cells function and stuff. Of course, it's gonna look like we're all related because ev everything functions similarly. Everything has the proteins to eat and stuff. It it doesn't mean we're related. So, so we actually can demonstrate that we are related to each other. But I have before I do that, I want to put put it to you in a question: If we're all created by an all powerful deity he can presumably do whatever the heck he wants what is stopping him or why would he create all humans and then all organisms uh as having you know certain proteins certain uh uh genetic structures certain organelles why would a an all-powerful deity do that why not why not create some organisms out of rocks you know, why not make some out of air, or out of fire, out of water? Why are they all based on at least one cell? Why do they all have DNA, all have RNA, they all have proteins? Uh, you know, ATP synthase and a few other things. But what would be the point of a deity doing all that? Well, because they need all that stuff to survive. Right, but a deity... Who can who is all powerful doesn't have to do it that way, right? An all powerful deity could say, "Yes, I'm going to make these humans out of cells, but I'm going to make these other organisms out of rocks, and I'm going to give them the same lifelike qualities as humans, but they'll be made out of rocks or out of water or fire or air or whatever." Uh, I, an all powerful deity wouldn't have to make all the organisms on Earth everything. You know, we consider living, with the exception of viruses, because they're weird, um, out of cells. What would be the point of that? It, it seems a little bit deceptive, almost, to say that, that, you know, just everything is made of the same, of, of the same basic blueprint just because God wanted it to. Don't, don't you think that would be a little bit deceptive? Uh, well, yeah, kind of. Uh, right. Now the or the organisms made of rocks that's and fire and stuff that's actually uh, part of this thing called Jainism that says everything lives. Huh. Okay. Well, I hadn't heard of. I I think I'd heard of that. Uh, 
Or maybe I had. I think those were the guys in uh, Seven Years in Tibet who were like moving the earthworms out of the dirt so that when they built the uh, the theater, they weren't killing any earthworms. I think those were Jainists. Yes, they were. Yeah, okay. I have confirmation on that. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but when we're looking at this from a scientific perspective, everything that we call living, again, with the exception of viruses, um, is made of these certain characteristics. So it's most parsimonious to conclude not that they were created, each created independently, but that they're all descended from a common ancestor who also had these characteristics and that they built on these characteristics over time, slowly but surely, and we can actually test that. Um, I mean, like, you know, one of the ways we can see, uh, we can test the relatedness among people is, you know, through, through a, a paternity test, right? Um, you know, for instance, uh, you know what Ancestry.com is, right? Oh, yeah. There's commercials about it all the time. Right. So Ancestry.com tells us that, you know, you send a little bit of your DNA and they can figure out your, or presumably they can figure out your your ancestry, who you're related to, uh, who your ancestors were going back a certain number of years. Uh, imagine they can't go back too far. Um, but they can also, they you know, they can look at your which are mitochondrial haplogroups. Haplogroups are these little sections of mitochondrial DNA that uh, can tell us where you're from. Uh, for instance, like Native Americans have certain mitochondrial haplogroups. Europeans have certain ones, Africans, etc. And so we can kind of tell, uh, you know, how how humans have moved around on planet earth over time because we can compare their, the, these little sections of mitochondrial DNA. Uh, the reason I'm, uh, I'm kind of skeptical about DNA because, you know, humans share 60% of our DNA with bananas and, and that's More like 50. Okay. That's kind of stupid. You know, we don't have anything in common with bananas at all. We do. We actually have a lot in common with bananas. Well, so bananas are a fruit. They're a part of a tree. So what we're really talking about here is the banana tree. So we it's, it's more like 50%, but the point's about the same. So, so, so for instance, we share with uh, – our cells have a nucleus, right? You're in – Biology, you guys have talked about like you know cellular components, right? Yes, yes. Eukaryotic right. cells have nucleus. Right. So trees, like the banana tree, and us, we both have nuclei in our cells. Uh, we both have DNA. We have RNA. We have you know ribosomes, uh, endoplasmic reticulum. We have uh, mitochondria. We have a whole whole lot of different parts. We have a whole lot of different parts. Um, we also share, like you said, you know, 50% of our DNA. So presumably, if God made plants separate from the humans, as it says in the creation account, plants shouldn't necessarily have any of the same DNA as us if they have DNA at all, right? I mean, God could do that. He's all-powerful. He can make these however he chooses. But if God created these things, he chose to give plants a certain amount of DNA that we share with them. And again, why would God do that unless he were trying to make it seem deceptively like we share a common ancestor? Well, we, well you see, we don't... We, we, it, no, we have... A, actually, I'm talking about like physical features. We don't have anything in common with plants. We don't have leaves. We don't have bark mm -hmm, right so so those things so those parts the leaves and the bark they're specified by dna right well not ex not exactly what do you mean well the leaves and bark they they just grow that right so they grow because the dna is telling the cells to go in these certain places to differentiate and do these different jobs. And some of those jobs are being the leaves or the bark, right? Right. So, so you, 
uh, we have a question from um, uh, from Lady Girl person. You recognize that DNA is used in in trial in court trials or court cases, for instance, right? Uh, fingerprints are well, well, also DNA, like you know, from hair samples or blood blood stains or whatever blood samples, right? Hmm. So we use so we use DNA to figure out like if no one saw you know a crime happen like someone you know breaks into a store and shoots the only person who could have been a witness and escapes and no there are no witnesses well we have to figure out who did it but we can't do it by eye we can't do it by eyewitness because we can't ask the only person who's dead right so we have to use inference from what is there and there might be fingerprints on the door there might be you know hair or if there was an altercation the the criminal might have left blood at the scene or a shoe print or you know, or whatever. And so we can determine based on what's there that this person did it. And you, you understand that that, that, that can be a big part of determining, you know, uh, who did crimes, right? Yes. There's, there's also security footage. That's, that's a big whopper in court. Right. But if there's no security footage, no one saw it. And, and we had DNA. You you understand that 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 is important. If there's no one to see it happen, no footage, no witnesses, that DNA alone can determine who committed a crime, right? So, so, but then how would we distinguish it from like a banana killed this person? Well, because like you said, we only share about fifty percent of DNA with bananas, right? So it would definitely be human. And then we could look, and then we could compare. Uh, you know, you can do things like a, I think it's PCR testing, uh, where you can compare the DNA found at the at the the crime scene with a number of samples of DNA that you have on file or whatever, and then you can compare those and see who committed the crime, right? Well, that's how they do it. Right. So, so we understand that if we were to take you know, banana DNA, it would not come out at all like like how the human DNA came out. It would be radically different. Hmm. Because we only share about fifty percent of our genes with with uh you know plants and whatnot. So so uh so so you do understand the importance of DNA, right? You understand the importance of the you know the the genes being in being where they are, as well as a number of other parts of of DNA, right? Being where where they are. Yes, that's important because the cell has to function somehow. Right, right, right. When we you know the cell does transcription and whatnot, and translation, and it makes proteins, and they go off and do their little jobs elsewhere. Um, so. And so when people are related, we do paternity tests, we can see, you know, these parts are similar. And we can also see the parts that are different because of their own person. They're going to have little differences in their genome from their parents. And so, so the, that is important. So genetics, genetics is actually the best evidence of evolution that we have because we can demonstrate, we can repeatedly demonstrate relatedness among organisms. And so... So if, if uh, you know, if 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 we didn't have genetics, it would it would be uh, evolution would be more focused on like physical features. But now, which it was, but now we have it, and so we can tell definitely who's related to who. We can even do that for some recently extinct animals. Like I did a video fairly recently about elephant evolution. We have uh, DNA from uh, you know, mastodons and mammoths. And we can place them with relation to modern elephants. It turns out uh, mammoths are mo are more closely related to uh, Asian elephants than to African elephants, for instance. Okay, well, the problem is DNA and physical features are not reconcilable. If we are, uh, if we sh like, we share DNA with plants, but we're, but we're not plants. We don't have anything in common with plants. That's the DNA 
isn't reconcilable with the physical features. We don't have leaves or anything. So, well, well, for one thing, we like I said earlier, we DNA does actually code for a lot of parts that we do share in common uh, with plants, like uh, you know, building ATP uh, synthase and uh, cytochrome C and all these other parts. Um, but for humans, take humans for instance, take a population of humans. Well, you can see uh, if there was if there were a mutation in in this one person and he had you know a bunch of children and then they had children and then those children had children, we can track we can track that back by doing DNA tests on all of them back to that common ancestor in some cases and it has been done for instance with the uh, the mutation in this. Uh, protein called apolipoprotein A1 Milano. There was this family in Milan, Italy, which uh, this one guy developed a mutation a number of years ago or decades ago, and this mutation uh, allows them to digest more cholesterol than the average person. And so, by doing DNA tests on the family, all the people related who have this mutation, they can trace it back to the first person who got that that mutation and so so dna is is very good it's very important that we are able to use it uh we can't just throw dna out the window because court cases you know for instance are decided on it who's the the father is decided on that uh a whole lot of things are based on it i mean and like we were talking about earlier ancestry.com uses your dna to figure out uh, who you're related to uses your uh, mitochondrial haplogroups and things like that. So it is very important because in the case of haplogroups, for instance, DNA, uh, the mitochondrial DNA can tell us where your family was at a certain point in the past. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm descended from uh, Native Americans on one side. And so, um, so if, if I were to get a DNA test, they would be able to see those haplogroups from the Native Americans in me, right? Someone from Europe who has no Native American ancestry, well, they wouldn't have that haplogroup, and we can show that. So DNA can tell us, in certain cases, how your family has moved around. Okay, so then, so why don't we have leaves or bark or branches? Because we don't have the DNA to specify for any of that. Remember, we only have about 50% DNA with these guys. That 50% we don't have is what specifies for for flowers or leaves or bark or you know bananas or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So sometime in our past, uh, someone had sex with a tree. No, in the in the not exactly in the distant past. Our common ancestor with trees lived about one one and a half billion years ago, so that common ancestor would have been a unicellular uh, eukaryote, so a single cell eukaryote. Uh, and what we interestingly, what we see when we go both directions on that tree, <laughs> on that cladistic tree, uh, is that we see there are unicellular protists at the base of the plant tree, and also unicellular protists at the base of of the tree going in the other direction, which leads to protists and fungi and eventually us. And so we can determine at least partly based on that, but also uh, partly based on you know, genetics and the, the fossil record is not really good in this case. So it's mostly about, about genetics and, and uh, comparing these different guys to see where they fall, who they're most closely related to that our common ancestor would have been a unicellular eukaryote, right? So, so eventually, so that unicellular eukaryote would have given birth theoretically to two different populations: one that went off and became the plants, and the other that went off and became the the eventual ancestors of the other protists and fungi and animals. Right. So that's that's the general idea. Okay, but how does fu fungi come from eukaryote? Fungi is prokaryote. No. Fungi is eukaryote. They have uh, nuclei in their cells. 
But fungi is like bacteria. Bacteria is pro. No. no, bacteria and eukaryotes, or sorry, bacteria and archaeans are are the two uh, are the two prokaryotes. They have no nuclei in their cells, but fungi have nuclei in their cells. I can actually probably find a picture of uh, a nuclei, nucleus and fungal cell. Uh, okay, here's a picture. I, let me share my screen. Um, share. Okay. So here you go. Here's a picture of a fungus. And in this picture, it shows the the nuclei in their cells. It's just one example, right here. Wait, I don't see the nuclei. I just see blue dots. Right, the nucleus is inside. These are the what I would imagine the individual uh, cells. And so, uh, yeah, it says it's a, a yeast cell, and so the nucleus is here inside. Is what it's pointing out here inside the cell. Um, uh, I wonder if I can find any other direct pictures of it. Well, the point is that fungi are uh, that fungi are eukaryotes. Uh, if you take a if you take a microbiology class, you'll get to look at some fungal cells under the microscope, which is what uh, we actually got to do uh, last week, or uh, what I got to do last week. Got to look at some fungal cells under the microscope. Hmm. I, I think I'll I'll probably take microbiology next year. Yeah, great. It's it's fun. It's fun stuff. I really like I like uh, cells and whatnot. They're all very neat. Um. Uh, but <laughs> in college, it's very difficult. <laughs> or but some biology is very difficult for me here. Um. Uh oh. In our end, uh oh. Did I actually? Whoops. I might have... Did I mess that up? Okay, I'm sorry, folks. I think I messed that up when I did that. Okay. What would you there mess you up? There we go. This, I, I think I was... I think I had it on, on you when I clicked uh, screen share. And I forgot to take it off. So for everybody, sorry about that. Uh, nucleus is in here. There you go. Okay. Uh... Back on you. Okay, there we go. Uh, RJ, no one saw. Okay, I'm sorry. There you go. You get to see it now. You can also go look online. Just type in nucleus fungal cell. So, uh, anyways. Okay, so um, so now do you understand the importance of of genetics in biology in determining relatedness? Hmm. Yes, but I'm not exactly sure that means we're related to apes. Cause, cause w when did we lose our all our hair and our ugly faces? Uh, well, I don't know. Some of us today still aren't pretty, myself included. But um, but uh, <laughs> but um, well, actually, well, we still do have quite a bit of hair on us. And also, as I as I mentioned earlier. If you describe all the commonalities, if you like look at chimps, gorillas, orangutans, and gibbons, chimps, gorillas, orangutans, gibbons, there we go. Uh, you describe all the commonalities of these guys. You describe humans also. And we also see that we are upwards of 95, 96% genetically similar uh, to, or genetically identical to, to chimps. Uh, chimps and, and bonobos. So... Well, um, but we lost our hair somewhere in the past, uh, five, you know, somewhere over the past five to six million years. Um, we had ancestors like Australopithecines that were a lot hairier than us. Uh, Homo habilis was probably pretty hairy. Uh, um, yes, chimps, bonobos. Um, and so... So over that time, we can see that we lost hair for whatever reason, uh, and and that's why we are like we are now. 
Uh, what's really interesting about about uh, human evolution is that we're is <laughs> I'll try to ex explain this as layman as I can because I, if I don't, I'll start using words like uh, neotenic, and I don't think a lot of people will understand that. So basically, baby chimps look a lot like adult humans. So over time, if you look at the human lineage, you've got these these forms that look more in their facial features like chimps and, and other apes, but they progressively become more human, and not just in their faces, but also in other body features like their, you know, their uh, clavicles, shoulders, they're also their pelvis, uh, their feet, all these other parts that we now have that differentiate us from chimps and whatnot. You can see this very slow progression over time f away from these these other characteristics towards the ones that we have today. And I did, I talked a little bit about that in a video I did titled The Source Methods Approach. Uh, I guess I can put it in the side over here. Because that was the video where I responded to uh, a number of different articles by creationists in a in a creationist article, so you can check that one out if you if you decide to. Um, one of the things uh, Mark Caesar makes a good point. Um, one of the things that we actually predicted that evolutionary biologists predicted based on uh, the idea that that humans are closely related to other apes. Was that we should have an we should have an extra pair of chromosomes, but it got lost, right? So chimps have uh, twenty four pairs of chromosomes. We have twenty three pairs of chromosomes, but and so we our our pair our other pair missing pair kind of disappeared. Uh, why do we have you know forty six uh, chromosomes in total? They have forty eight. Well, it turns out it didn't just vanish; it actually fused. This other pair fused with. Uh, a different pair, which was our second chromosome pair. And so now chromosome two, which we have today, has the remnants of that other pair of chromosomes. It has little the little uh, end or the little central parts of the uh, like because the center of a chromosome is called the centromere, right? And so we can actually see the remnants of centromeres and also I think telomeres in in our second chromosome, right? So if we weren't descended from apes that had 48 chromosomes instead of 46, we shouldn't expect that, right? If God just created us, you know, Adam and Eve, like we are right now, just humans with our normal number of chromosomes, then we shouldn't have those, right? It would make no sense for us to have those extra chromosomes. <sighs> well, the... Well, those those extra chromosomes, the that's that's what determines our gender, right? Yeah, X and Y. Uh, no, that's part of the twenty-three. Oh, which one are you? Oh, is that chromosome two? Well, chromosome two it, it uh, does not determine our gender. Um, chromosome two is if you have if you have mutations in chromosome two, for instance, I, you get like a autism, uh, and and also interestingly. Uh, it's like the same mutations for autism in us, if I remember correctly, cause autism also in chimpanzees. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, not, not chromosome 2 for gender. Uh, chromosome yeah. 2, like what you were talking about. Right. So so that's another place where where evolutionary biology was was able to make a prediction based on what we should expect if evolution is true, and it was validated. Right. So, so what do you think about that? Mm. Well, so, so some things have more chromosomes than us. That 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 doesn't really like prove evolution, because you know God could have created stuff with just having less chromosomes than the other. Well, correct. Yes, he could have done that, but he created us allegedly with the remnants of other chromosomes. So, again, that's another point where I would think if God did that, God would be kind of deceptive. Don't you think that would be kind of deceptive to... It, like, for instance, if, if you were to... Uh, you know, you were to build a house, but then in the middle of the house you were to build like a... Uh, 
like a, 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 a Mayan architecture, like ancient Mayan architecture or something like that, and make it look old and everything so that people can't tell the difference. People will think it is old, but it's not actually. Don't you think that would be kind of deceptive? Well, yes, but, but the, the, the thing... <sighs> the remnants of chromosomes but we're talking about god creating stuff it's it's not like remnants i mean like you know it's just pieces well the so this what the centromere the centromeres and the telomeres are specified by certain uh groups of or by certain uh repeats if i remember correctly of nucleotides and so it makes no sense for these repeats of nucleotides, which we understand to be centromeres and telomeres, to be in centromere in in chromosomes already that don't function as the centromere or telomeres, it doesn't really make any sense for for any of those to exist. Uh, and so it, it it's kind of like like I said, like building like a an, a faux ancient Mayan you know, architecture inside of a newly built house. It doesn't really make any sense, and it's kind of deceptive. But the the point is, it's but it's more like we know that this is ancient. We understand how what this is called a Robertsonian fusion. We understand how these fusions can occur, and we understand what centromeres and telomeres look like. And we understand, you know, our relationship with other uh, primates, other apes, and so all of it fits within an evolutionary model it none of it fits within the creation model and so if you if you read creation literature they kind of don't really know how to handle it how to handle things like that uh did you see the movie uh genesis paradise lost uh, no that, that i i don't think that was released here in the state of georgia Okay, it, it only came out in select theaters, so uh, yeah, I don't know where all it came out, but it came out here in Baton Rouge, where I am, and so Savannah and I saw it. And so they have these two creationist guys, one named Charles Jackson, uh, and I forget who the other guy is. He's a microbiologist, allegedly. Uh, I'm sure he is. Um, but uh, basically, Charles Jackson says, we don't have genetic, or we don't share a lot of genetic similarities with chimps. The very next scene, because they're interviewing people, it's kind of like a documentary. So the very next scene, the the microbiologist is interviewed, and he says, well, we do have genetic similarities with chimps. We have a lot of them, but it doesn't matter. So creationists, if you if you listen to what they, they say, they don't really know how to handle, how to talk about these the, the things like this. And I, I really I encourage you to uh, to read... Uh, Answers in Genesis Literature or Institute for Creation Research Literature because I do and RJ does and a lot of us do. A lot of us read stuff from Answers in Genesis because we want to know what they're saying about these topics and occasionally I'll make videos where I address some of the things in their, in their articles like I uh, in, in the response video you made I mentioned an article by Andrew Snelling where he was talking about rapid oil formation, right? You remember that? Uh, oh yeah, that one. Right. So, so part of the thing. So the thing, the the article that he wrote came from Creation dot com, and uh, or the CMI, Creation Ministries International, and the argument that Snelling made, because Snelling is a creationist uh, geologist, is that oil can form rapidly. So he writes this whole article talking about how oil can form rapidly, and he bases his argument on these two articles written in like the 80s, I think. I know one was written in 1985, but I can't remember the other. So in this article, he bases his arguments on, they actually make the exact opposite conclusion that he's trying to make them, that he's saying that they make. Right? Because you have, when you have uh, these, these hydrocarbons that uh, make up oil, you have, uh, oh yeah, you can also see uh, Tony Reed. I think he has a video. He, no, I know, he does have a video on it also, so I'll put his name over here on the side uh, just in case. So Tony Reed. Um, so, so I look at the articles that he, that he cites for this claim because I wanted to know if what he was saying about it, about these articles, was true. 
it turns out it's not because oil these hydrocarbons can be either um can be either uh biogenic or abiogenic if they're abiogenic that means they're not derived from from organisms if they are abi if they are biogenic then they are right so this article says it talks about how to make abiogenic oil which is not derived from organisms in a relatively short time period i think it's days or weeks but what he's trying to make a case for in his article is that biogenic oil which is you know, derived these biogenic hydrocarbons derived from organisms that once lived and have now died became and you know and whatnot uh he was trying to make the case that these guys could form oil rapidly but they can't because to him uh if creationism is true then oil has to be able to form rapidly but it can't at least not biogenic oil not the kind of oil that that uh that that he that he wanted to form rapidly and so that's kind of part of what i was talking about in my video or in paul's video i should say uh in my in my speech when i was referring to creationists like like snelling and others and georgia purdom and Bodie hodge and avery foley uh ignoring evidence to make their arguments and that's what uh, that's what rj does rj actually has a whole website called uh troubles in paradise which i also write down here in the side chat uh where he documents not only the creationist claims, but how they uh, avoid the data or misuse the data. And I would, I definitely recommend if you, if you don't see anything else, I would recommend seeing that website because it's fantastic. Um, and so, so it's it's very important. And so it's 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 very important that when we're making arguments, we look at all the data, right? You would say that, right? Yes. And so, go ahead. Oh. Oh no! I was just answering your question. Yes, we have to look at all the data. Right. So, so Ken Ham and Bodie Hodge and all these other guys, when they're trying to make arguments, they have to avoid large amounts of data. As it happens, RJ has determined that, and you can actually see, you can see it on his website, that creationists avoid or ignore way over half the data that is available, the relevant technical data to their arguments. And so, do it? Or, more realistically, they just don't know about it. It's possible. Yeah, it, I mean, that is definitely possible. It's possible they just, you know, they just weren't looking for it. Um, but if, for instance, Bodie Hodge, one, this is another article I talked about in my video, The Source Methods Approach. Bodie Hodge wrote an article about Native Americans in North, in, or, you know, Native North Americans. Basically, he says that native North Americans got here because or after the Tower of Babel incident, right? So the Tower of Babel occurred, you know, God knocked it over and the languages were the various languages were created and the people went off in their separate ways, right? Yeah, that's that's what happened. Right. Okay. So so Bodhi says that that was only, you know, a, a few thousand years ago, like maybe four thousand years ago, something like that, when this happened. And Native Americans came, you know, or the ancestors of the Native Americans came to North America. So if that were true, we should be able to make predictions about that. Like, we should be able to determine that in the past 4,000 years, all Native Americans, or at least the vast majority of them, are descended from, ultimately, um, Middle Easterners, you know, around 4,000 years ago. As it happens, that's not what we find. What we've determined through... Uh, through genetics and through uh, the geography of of uh, like Siberia uh, is that and also you know looking at their their skeletal features is that Native Americans got to North America around somewhere between 12 and 14 thousand years ago and their descended and their closest relatives are the people in Eastern Asia not Middle East so, and we can tell that again, this is using our haplogroups, these little sections of our DNA. Um, also, I realized I just now, as I see what time it is, uh, I've kept you uh, long after you said you wanted to uh, to have ended about, when I say like half an hour or so after you wanted to uh, to have ended. So if you want if if you want to end, now we can pick this up another time. That's fine. If you want to continue, that's also fine. 
Uh, uh, I know you have school, so if if you want to end now, it's okay. Yeah, I gotta go too, cause the people downstairs are beginning to get angry. Okay. All right. Well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I apologize for for keeping you half an hour over. Uh, I said I would. Sorry about that. Um, I do thank you for talking with me. Um, do you think? Do you think that what I'm telling you, at least right now, is is worth investigating? Well, yes, it is definitely worth investigating about DNA and like bananas and stuff. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Well, uh, I will uh, talk to you another time. We'll get in. We'll uh, keep in touch. Okay. So thank you again for coming on, and thank you everyone. Uh, who listened, who was in the chat there. Uh, I'm signing off, and I'll see all of you. Bye.